Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Photo Finale, and Advertech Printing. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Drew Sakala, co-owner and vice president of Lens Rentals. Hi, Drew. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? So for our listeners who are not familiar with Lens Rentals, can you kind of give us the elevator pitch? What what was the idea that, you know, people really need to start renting some lenses? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my dad, uh, you know, is the photographer in the family. Uh, I'm just, you know, the uh, the son that was on the business side of things. So for him, he was just a really, really into the gear side hobbyist. Um, really enjoyed, you know, learning more about glass, getting the latest glass. And Memphis is not a very large town. And, and it would just, you know, we had a camera stores, but there was nowhere that you could rent here at all. Um, and even if you were somewhere like Chicago or New York and you walked into your local camera store, you could rent, you know, a beat up copy of a handful of lenses and pay a deposit that was the same amount, you know, as the cost of the of the new product. So right. he just really was looking for a way to write off his, ta- his uh, gear. You know, he wasn't. Okay. <laughs> and so he said, what, you know, there got to be other people like me. I'm going to put it all on a website. And by that weekend, I mean, it was all gone. Um, mm-hmm. And it just kind of went from there. You know, back then there were probably seven, eight other people doing what we did at the same time. And it was just right. kind of. Uh, buying as much gear as you could as quick as you could and since then we've just kind of went wherever the market's taken us so how many how big is your staff there uh we fluctuate right now probably 175 total across all of our locations so so that's a lot of growth over the last decade yeah Uh, and so just just from a trivia standpoint how many lenses do you have in the catalog unique copies or like you know SKUs just units just to, yeah oh, you had to probably, figure out hey we've got 10,000 lenses or yeah that sounds about right uh <laughs> okay maybe about 5,000 cameras but you know um it's a it's a large number and it's uh it's weird how desensitized you become to it when you work here what does that mean by desensitized oh you'll just see people who you know they've worked here for two months and they'll have a bin full of, you know, five D fours just mounded up, you know. Right. And it's like that's a that's a that's a six figure bin you have there, and it's, <laughs> it's no different than taking out the trash, moving that from desk to desk. Just sometimes you stop and think, like, wow, that is that's a lot. <laughs> so you've obviously expanded beyond lenses. You got into camera bodies. So what are some of the other? What are some of the array of items you can rent? from lunch rentals? Like, is, does it get into lighting, tripods, anything like that? Absolutely. At this point, we will rent just about anything that we can fit in a box and FedEx will let us send out to people that they want to rent. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are a few things people want to rent that we can't rent. You know, we would love to rent, you know, 20 foot cranes, but that's not really a thing we can do right. um, through FedEx. So, Uh, We carry lighting, we carry video equipment support, um, we carry production tools, you know, we have iPads, walkie talkies, projectors, um, drones, you know, it really has kind of crept upwards over the years into into just little side steps into further markets. So what about like the liability side of that in terms of, you know, let's say you're running a drone to somebody and they may not be aware of some of the restrictions of where you can fly a drone or something like that. Um, What, how do you handle something like that? Is there a pre-screening process? We do verify our customers to some degree. You know, we want to make sure people um, are obviously good stewards of our equipment. And part of that is to make sure they know uh, what they're doing and they have the skills necessary to do it. So Mm -hmm. um, With our drones specifically, we kind of go through uh, a warning process with people, make sure they understand all the requirements. Right. Uh, But on top of that, you know, if we saw, um, you know, if someone told us they were going to do something with a drone that's ill-advised, we we would not (laughs) send it to them. Um, But so far, I want to do end-to-end Grand Canyon. I can do that on a drone. (laughs) I mean, you can. It's not a good idea uh, (laughs) for you or the drone, but uh, theoretical. So 
One of the ideas uh, that kind of inspired me to reach out to you to do this is sort of the idea of the overall trend of people wanting to rent more as opposed to actually own things. How has that impacted your business? Because there is a lot of this overall feel that, you know, subscriptions are going to replace software licensing. And, uh, you know, I know you're not going to own a DVD collection. You're just going to rent from a streaming service. So is that what's part of driving uh, Lens Rentals growth? It is to some degree. Um, but I think more importantly, it has stopped being a barrier. Um, you know, when we first started, we got lots of people who would look at a rental price compared to a retail price and go, you know, right. why would I pay 5% of what it costs to own this to use it for a week? But I think everybody has come to value a little bit more than they did 15 years ago, what it means to, to have the costs of owning something. You know, it's great that uh, it has a, a resale value for you, but only, you know, if you're not going to use it, you're not going to use it. And I think people right. really do appreciate that more now. Um, that that paying per use of something, you know, makes a ton of economic sense for people. How much of your business is are professionals who are renting for a gig versus, let's say, an advanced hobbyist who either wants to try something out before they buy it, or maybe they're going on a once in a lifetime trip and they, you know, and they need that piece of gear? I would say probably a third of our customers are just truly hobbyists, um, right. you know, and then there's, there's a big blurry middle batch where <laughs> people make money, um, right. you know, but maybe not full time. And then we do have our professional photographers, people who, you know, they own their own single person studio, but then we go all the way up to broadcast crews, mm -hmm. um, you know, full, you know, independent motion pictures, TV shows. So um, it really runs the entire gamut. So that's interesting because obviously there's a lot of rental houses that work with the established studios, right? I mean, obviously in Hollywood and New York, there's large established players. Are you competing with those? No, we don't see ourselves really competing with that. You know, when I've been in LA or I've been in New York and I've talked to uh, cinematographers, a lot of them have a personal relationship, you know, that's been built up. Sure. Over decades in the industry with, with these local rental houses. And, you know, that's not a relationship we can replace. Right. Um, but at the same time, these days, everyone's shooting so many different formats that a traditional rental house just doesn't have everything you need. Um, you know, there's people who can afford to shoot on $60,000 cameras, but are choosing to shoot on $2,500 ones because it makes more sense for what they're shooting. And that's right. really where we come in on those things. For example, let's say there's a there's a movie shoot and uh, they need a, a, a camera for a specific effect shot or a uh, action sequence where they mean like may, they may need like ten GoPros or something. Is that the sort of application you think you'd be more suited for? Yes, it's it's a lot of that stuff, a lot of unique one off. You know, we're trying to pull off this thing and it needs you know twenty five camera bodies. We've done you know tons of those where we send out. 25 identical kits and we know somebody's doing something cool with it um right. just never quite sure what it is but we do rent stuff all the way up to those you know sixty thousand dollar video cameras for the people who are branching out into that it just tends to be the established you know mm -hmm. cinematographers tend to use who they use for that stuff so video has really come on pretty strong hasn't it? i mean you started as still photography because your father was a photographer right but video has really taken off yeah uh we hired our first video techs in 2010, um, and it was uh, two 22-year-olds two um, because people kept asking us about different accessories they wanted to use with a Canon 5D2, you know, right. um, microphones and stuff like that. We've moved on from, from that all the way up through higher in cinema, and it's really just been us carrying what the customer would ask us to because, you know, a customer jumps from one level to another and we start carrying more equipment and that brings in a higher level of customer. And then those people jump, you know, in their career higher up and we're there for right. them. So it really, we've just built up along with our customer base. There seems to be a rapid escalation in the new equipment being reintroduced. You know, there used to be, you know, one time a year, maybe at NAB or something like that, you would have new equipment being introduced. But now it's almost an unending assault if you will, uh, new products being introduced. How much of a challenge is that for your company to keep up with that? It's a challenge. Um, 
because every new camera, especially, you know, these higher, like so much of it right now is focused on the high end of the market. So right. it's really pushing technological boundaries, you know, a lot of these cameras and sure. it takes us time to have enough customers with them in the field to really understand them. So it almost feels like as soon as we start to understand the camera, then, you know, that company is releasing a slightly different version of the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. But but it's really become fragmented on the top end of the market. Um, much right. more, almost like the low end used to be with consumer DSLR is coming out every three months. When you have this rapid escalation, how long do you support a model? Let's say, for example, you know, you've got a popular model and uh, of a, of a, camera body and let's say it's even out of service from the original manufacturer do you keep those in line how long do you keep equipment for it depends on how well the manufacturer supports it and and the customer interest obviously lenses are easier um Mm -hmm. so we might we might have a couple of really dusty copies of a lens that's been discontinued for five years available for rent for people who just really really want that um but obviously cameras are little bit harder to keep alive once you know they stop supporting them so we tend to probably keep stuff a year past when it's discontinued but it really Mm -hmm. does depend on the camera do you what now what do you do with your discontinued product i mean i imagine in some ways you get some stuff that's pretty beat up and can't be resold but i imagine a lot of it is probably in pretty decent shape because you're maintaining stuff when it comes in you're probably cleaning every single time when they come in you're probably doing a a uh look at the shutter and making sure it's all good before it can sell. It's probably better maintained than most people's cameras. Yeah, we have an in-house uh, repair department who, you know, not just right before sale, but keeps up with the cosmetics on the lens throughout its life. It's just a lot easier to replace things like rubber belts, um, right. you know, every three months when they look a little dusty. Um, right. So our gear stays in really good shape for sale. And we sell stuff on a rolling basis, honestly, from you know, as early as six months after it's launched, we might be selling off copies of it. And and from then on, we kind of cycle in and out, you know, sell off the older ones, buy new ones, keep it fresh. So pretty much anything but new releases we have up for sale. I imagine you've got a pretty, that's a pretty decent sized revenue stream, actually, because I imagine people are, you know, they're always looking, people are always looking for a deal, right? And they can pretty much be assured that what they're getting from you is going to be maintained, at least, rather than some rando off eBay. Yeah, it's, it's going to be maintained. And also people really do tend to trust our ratings, which is a big point of anxiety when people are buying used gear. You're using somebody mm-hmm. else's subjective, you know, this is an eight out of 10, or this is in good condition or very good. Uh, we're fortunate right. to have a lot of trust in that department. So I think that's one of the things that really sets it apart and, and, and makes people want to come to us as opposed to eBay. It's just a little bit more like buying retail. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, because I mean, you do have people, let's say they're, they're a customer of yours, and they realize, you know, hey, I'm gotten used to this body or using this, this platform, and they're discontinuing this camera, oh, I might want to pop for that, right? So, and so I imagine a lot of your sales are to existing customers. Yes, and we also have people who, you know, there's a ton of, especially on the amateur end of the market, but it's really throughout all the market of people who or simply renting because there's nowhere to pick up a camera or lens and try it anymore. You know, it's just a, I don't want to spend five grand on this till I pick it up and I put it in my hand at some point. And so we had a lot of people just asking to buy the copy they had in their hand. So now these days we kind of have a two button um, way to just, you know, whatever's in your hand, will give you a depreciation price based on how beat up it is right there and just keep it. Um, wow. So people really like that. Cause it, it, you know, if you are renting it to try it out and then you've got a copy you like, why send it back mm-hmm. and get another one? So um, that's also a really popular way people end up, you know, keeping the equipment permanently. So how has COVID affected the business? Because clearly, you know, people aren't traveling as much. So that sort of segments decline. People are, you know, I don't know what's even happening in, in the production world of, of movie media or television media. So as we come out of COVID, how do things look? I think things are looking pretty good for the industry relative to what I would have thought they'd be like if you asked me the same question last summer. Okay. You know, we're seeing demand come back. We're seeing production pick back up. And I think when we get into the warmer weather months here this summer, I think we're going to really see a good boom. You know, there's a lot of people who've been cooped up for a long time who want to get a creative outlet. So, I mean, for us, you know, it's not always about marketing budgets and commercial activity. It's just about 
people wanting to rent mm-hmm. a lens and do something interesting. Right. You know, we haven't rented a lens to anyone who just used it to go walk around a strange city in a year. You know, that, that'll be great to come back. Curious, you know, the sort of encroachment into the pro space with some of the smartphone technology. Uh, how do you see, I mean, I, I'm assuming you may rent a smartphone here or there, but do you see that as impacting some of the uh, pro-am space, if you will? Probably not. I think it's, you know, it's re- obviously replaced the DSLRs people would buy at Target, you know, um, or right. or Walmart right there off the counter. Um it's replaced that part of the market, but that part of the market really only ever existed for the manufacturers. I mean, even camera stores didn't make a ton of money off, you know, consumer level cameras. So I think it's not really harming the industry because people who need cameras still need cameras. You know, uh, you're not going to show up to shoot a wedding with a smartphone and get paid for it at least. Well, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it's funny, you, you hear tales of that and it frightens me that Uncle Bob is trying to take a picture of, or take a photos at a wedding and sell them, right? Like you said, I think there is sort of that distinction between the, the, the pro market and the pro-am market and the amateur market. And it's certainly true that smartphones have encroached and replaced the bottom end. It's just some, I mean, I just had some, some recent discussions with folks who are like, you know, I'm starting, I, I can see it almost being a pro capture device. And I'm not sure I'm there yet, but people are talking that way. Yeah, it depends on what you're using it with, too. Um, you know, with the Ronins and things like that, I mean, these days, some of these camera stabilizers, you know, when you don't have motion going on, they do look pretty good. I mean, it, yeah. you know, but then again, if you're stabilizing a phone, you might as well stabilize a camera. You know, uh, right. it's a little bit like when you see a mirrorless camera and it's really compact and that's great. And then they put a nine pound lens on the front of it. It's like really saving you any space or, or weight. You know, it honestly looks like it's more difficult to hold than with the DSLR. So I think you see some of that too. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I see a lot of press releases on new gear and there's all kinds of attachments and, and gimbals and craziness you can add onto a smartphone, for example, to make it a production level piece of gear. And I'm looking at this thing going, wow, that's that that takes away some of the portability and convenience when you've got this sort of array of equipment all around it. Absolutely. You know, I think smartphones too, they'll replace like the GoPro um, behind the scenes type cam, you know, oh, the sure. guy, the yeah. guy running around holding the GoPro on a gimbal, you know, but uh, so, I mean, they're great production tools. I would say that that's, that's part of the reason why we do rent some smartphones. I mean, they are, um, we don't rent them for the cell phone purpose, but like people, they are useful production tools to have a little touch screen in your pocket that can control 50 different things through apps. So no, I agree. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dissing them from a from a tool standpoint, it's just it's just interesting to see how, you know, there's hype versus reality, right? Um, so we'll see how it goes. I mean, who, who knows? I mean, we never thought GoPros would be as popular as yeah. they are, right? In terms of, you know, I mean, I look at shows like, you know, Survivor or a lot of reality TV shows almost shot completely on GoPros, <laughs> it looks like. Yeah, and in 4K too, you know, it's amazing what you can, can make with 4K hidden GoPro footage on some of these nature shows and things like that. Yeah, it's crazy. So- um, going, you know, through 2021, uh, you think the future is bright. Uh, what do you think the industry should be looking out for in terms of what you're hearing from the manufacturers on equipment trends? Is 8K finally going to be the thing or smaller, better, or is it more of the same? I mean, everything's going to have 8K, I think is kind of where you're going to go in the same way that for a while there, when 4K first became a thing, I mean, they were shoving 4K in the cameras that didn't need 4K. Um, right. The 4K, you know, mode was not good. And at that time, you know, no one owned a 4K TV. And we're like, why, why do $1,000 cameras need 4K that no one has? So mm-hmm. right. I think we'll probably go through a wave of that to some degree. But um, where people just, they have 8K footage and they can't, they don't have a computer that's worthy of it. Uh, <laughs> right. So there's going to be some of that. And, and we've kind of gone through waves of that where, where some part of the technology is kind of leapt forward and it's like, well, that's great, but how useful is it? Um, you know, the D 800, you know, those high megapixel cameras, same thing with lenses there for a minute. Yeah. It was like, what, who why do you need megapixels? it? And then it just became I don't standard. Know. Um, yeah. I don't know who needs 50 megapixels. Personally, I'm holding out for, for 24 K on my next camera. That, that's what I'm holding out. For. We'll get there. <laughs> I know that's what you used to say silly things like they'll never have 50 megapixel cameras and here they are. And now yeah, 24 K will be here. Yeah. Are you seeing just one last thing, just kind of curious. We haven't touched on this. 
yet. Um, are you seeing any interest, like real interest as from a trend standpoint in like AR and VR? I mean, I'm certain the equipment's out there, but actually people shooting a reasonable amount of content with it because there, you know, there's the hype machine and then there's the reality of the situation. It is a growing area for us. Um, you know, it started small, so it's not like it's um, a big uh, engine for us, but um, the people that rent it tend to, you know, do it full time. There are people out there who make a living at this, um, you know, a good living, uh, you know, doing events, especially in the pandemic. I mean, there's been a lot of a lot of people wanting to capture things in alternate ways um, to make experiences happen. So um, there's definitely a market for it, but I don't think it's going to be an everyday part of, you know, expectations as a professional that you can do that type of content, you know, in the same way that these days, people almost expect you in some ways to be able to handle at least some video um, basics. Right. I don't think we're ever going to get to that point with VR where it's that common, but you can definitely make a living at it. Um, it's a lot of corporate stuff, a lot of stuff that, you know, we see people doing with it that you don't realize is you know, shot 360, things like that. And when it becomes a thing, I'm sure lens rentals will be there. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Drew, for your time and uh, looking forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.